Okay. Well, welcome everyone to what I hope is going to be a thought provoking and interesting series of lecture discussions uh, on this relationship between Henry George, Karl Marx and their followers, which um, uh, continues to, to a degree today, uh, but it certainly was much intense in the early part of the 20th century when uh, both the single tax movement and the Marxist socialist communist movement was, were, were both still pretty much at the top of the uh, uh, alternative political schemes that were being put forward you know, by many people. So uh, what I've tried to do is, uh, is to see how this evolved and who were the key players and bring out some of the arguments that they were making back and forth with each other. So, um, you know, Marx, just to put it in the right context, you know, Marx in his writings is, is providing a critical analysis of capitalism. And I put capitalism in quotes because it's, it's Marx's interpretation of what capitalism is or was. And so that's the starting point from, from my perspective. Now, the rivalry that I refer to, it, it wasn't really fueled by Henry George or Karl Marx themselves. They never met, they never had any personal interaction. And Marx died in 1883. So it's pretty early in Henry George's uh, career as an author and as a public figure. So it's also the case that the uh, English language edition of Das Kapital didn't appear until 1887. And Henry George uh, did not speak or read in any language other than English. So what what input George had about what Marx was writing was really through others, was, was secondhand in that sense. George's uh, first extensive writings on political economy occurred in the early 1870s, as, as mostly everyone here will know. The main one titled Our Land and Land Policy. And that achieved a certain regional fame for Henry George in California, but, but never really served to bring him national uh, recognition. It's not until 1879 in the publication of Land and Liberty, I mean, of Progress and Poverty, that this and his other writings are, are beginning to spread around the world. Very quickly translated from English into other languages and therefore are, are attracting a, an international audience. So George learned that Marx had recently died and he was invited to address a memorial meeting for Marx at New York's Cooper Union. Um, George declined to attend in person, but he sent a message. And in the message, he admitted of his unfamiliarity with Marx's writings. And here's what he said in his message. Um, I never had the good fortune to meet Karl Marx, nor have I been able to read his works, which are untranslated into English. I am consequently incompetent to speak with precision of his views. As I understand them, there are several important points on which I differ from them, but no difference of opinion can lessen the esteem which I feel for the man who so steadfastly, so patiently, and so self-sacrificingly labored for the freedom of the oppressed and the elevation of the downtrodden. So certainly George is demonstrating here that he has a high regard for, for Marx uh, based on Marx, Marx's reputation that's been conveyed to him by others. Now, the British historian Roy Douglas, in his book, Land, People, and Politics, The Land Question in the United Kingdom, which came out in 1976, he compared the level of public awareness in Britain of these two great political economists. And he observed that, uh, he says, when Karl Marx died in 1883, there must have been dozens of Englishmen who had argued about Henry George for every one who had heard of the Prussian socialist. So George is becoming a, 
uh, an international personality uh, recognized uh, for his writings all, all over the world in many different countries. And Marx is still largely an unknown to the general population. Uh, now Marx, uh, before he died, did receive copies of Henry George's book, Progress and Poverty, um, 1880 and 1881. At least three different people uh, sent him Progress and Poverty and asked for his analysis of what George wrote. So from London in 1881 in June, Marx comes back and he writes to a man named Friedrich Sorge. He was a leading German communist who had come to the United States in 1852, and he had sent uh, Marx a copy of Progress and Poverty. And so uh, in a letter back to Sorge, uh, here's, what, here's what Marx wrote. He says, theoretically, the man Henry George is utterly backward. He understands nothing about the nature of surplus value and so wanders about in speculation, speculations which follow the English model, but have now been superseded even among the English about different portions of surplus value to which independent existence is attributed, about the relations of profit, rent, and interest. And, and this is a key observation, you know, that they, they're approaching the subject of political economy from a very different perspective. And Marx goes on to explain what he means by that. He says, his fundamental dogma is that everything would be all right if ground, went, ground rent were paid to the state. I said of it in 1847 in my work against Proudhon, we can understand that economists like Mill, the elder, not his son, John Stewart, and others have demanded that rent should be paid to the state in order that it may serve as a substitute for taxes. Um, and so basically Marx is looking at George as someone who has simply extended the uh, English analysis. And Marx is referring to John Stuart Mill here, um, who I think is probably still most famous for his essay on liberty. He's referring to the French mutualist philosopher, Pierre Joseph Proudhon, uh, author of the book, What is Property? And uh, you know, James Mill as well. So this is the basis for Marx's analysis of Henry, of Henry George's writings. Um, I don't know how much time Marx spent really studying Henry George or, he, or, or that he just gave the book a cursory review. Um, that I've not been able to ascertain by any of the research that I've done. And what he says about George's writing is basically this. He says, this is a frank expression of the hatred which the industrial capitalist dictate, uh, dedicates to the landed proprietor, who seems to him a useless and su superfluous element in the general total of bourgeois production. So he's looking at George as, as um, someone who, who is blaming everything on landed proprietors, whereas Marx is taking the point of analysis from the history of the development of the industri industrial production. Um, so let me stop there just for a second. Um, remind everyone, if you wanna enter this discussion, please feel free to do so. Um, I'd rather not lecture for 90, 90 minutes without interruption, unless less, uh, you're, you're after having, you've had dinner and now you're just sitting back in, 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 in quiet and thoughtful uh, uh, rest. But uh, use the reaction uh, mode on the Zoom screen so I can see your yellow hand coming up and I'll call on you, okay? So one of the things about that statement I found strange, and I'll pull this up to show you why. I found this interesting image uh, out there on the internet on landlordism and, and how it affects a society. And, you know, it's a vision of an octopus uh, and landlordism basically enclosing everything and, and, and causing all sorts of strife. But the statement's strange in the sense that 
Marx was born and lived in societies that were still very much dominated by landed privilege, um, by what political economists before him, uh, Adam Smith, uh, Richard Cantillon, and, and, and certainly the French, that are they're talking about rentier interests. Uh, and that is interests that are able to take in rent what others produce without themselves producing anything in exchange. That's basically what Henry George agreed with and came to on his own. So landlordism was at the time far more extensive everywhere than was the capitalism that Marx condemned. And this injustice um, and monopolies in whatever form was exactly what Henry George found so egregious in existing socio-political arrangements and institutions. So George is looking at monopoly of all of all to, all sorts from all sources as his enemy, as what needs to be attacked. And Marx is 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 emphasizing the monopoly of industrial production. Bill. You need to uh, unmute yourself, my man. You're still not unmuted. You're still not unmuted. Now, Bill, you're not, un you have to unmute yourself. I, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Okay, you did it. Finally, after three times clicks, I got it. Well, um, uh, it occurs to me in reacting to uh, one of the things you said uh, last night when Alex was talking about the 1886 election, um, she offered the thought that uh, Henry George was capable of slash and burn repartee along with the best of them. And uh, she didn't give any examples, but I'd love to hear some of it. Uh, but you, you'll it, hear a few from me. Okay. Well, what what you just uh, mentioned a little while ago is the comment that that George made about Marx, which was most gracious. Yes. Um, it, it's clear that he was not anxious to to engage in a in a slash and burn confrontation there. Well, remember, it's 1883, and George is, is, is still establishing his relationship with uh, those who might be left-leaning and who might be strongly influenced by Marx and particularly the labor leaders in the United States and, and in the UK. So um, I, I don't think he saw any reason to denigrate Marx as a as someone who's concerned about humanity. And, and he hadn't yet done a thorough study of Marx's writings because they weren't available to him. So, um, you know, it seems to me it was, a, it was an appropriate uh, way to, to comment in Marx's passing. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, uh, anything more? Okay, well, let me go on then. Uh, any, anyone else have any thoughts, uh, comments? Okay, well, I would say in fairness to Marx, his insights into how the world worked was, was really evolving. And we'll see that you know, later when we get into a discussion of the third volume of Das Kapital. And it's, and it's evident by that volume, which is edited from his notes by Engels and that's published in 1894. Now, I don't. There may be there may be someone who who knows uh, this story a little bit better than I I've been able to to find out about. But I don't know to what extent Engels um, expanded what Marx wrote and added his own thinking, or was it a a true um, effort to bring Marx's thoughts together without influence, without really changing any of any of Marx's insights. Um, what I think would be great to have would be a side by side comparison of Marx's um, handwritten manuscript and the final version of Das Kapital's volume three and see if there are any significant differences there. But anyway, in the preface of the book, Eng Engels explained 
that in his analysis of the role of ground rent in a society, Marx primarily looked to the Russian experience. And so that, that was a, that's pretty interesting to me that he would choose Russia as a, as a primary uh, source of insight into how landlordism was, was, was functioning. Somebody, uh, I heard so, something in the background. Does somebody else want to make a comment? No. I like that. Tom, is that you that you wanted to enter this? Tom Jacobson or not? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, so here's, here's what Engels wrote in the preface. He says, in the 70s, Marx engaged in entirely new special studies for this part on ground rent, owing to the variety of forms, both of land ownership and of exploitation of agricultural producers in Russia, this country was to play the same role in the part dealing with ground rent that England played in book one in connection with industrial wage labor. Um, I mean, there's, it, I, I don't know what information Marx was able to get and from, from what sources about, about Russia, but I thought that, that was an interesting observation that Engels makes of why he chose, chose Russia. And it's even more, uh, more interesting in the fact that, that landlordism was still pro, you know, uh, predominant in all of Britain. Uh, yes, there's this industrial production that's occurring, but it's occurring on top of landlordism. Landlordism hasn't been displaced. It's simply, you know, there's industrial landlordism, of course, as, as business interests acquire land as well uh, and use their profits from their business enterprise to acquire even more land. Um, so it's just a curious uh it's, it's curious to me that he chose to specifically look at Russia. And, and of course, uh, the Russian experience is, is unique in, in many ways. Certainly, it's unique to what was happening in the less populated areas of the world where Western civilization is expanding. And that, that would include the United States and Canada and Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, et cetera. Uh, for reasons Marx did not fully explain, his analysis of ground rent here again, as captured by Engels, is derived from a specific conclusion. And that conclusion is as follows. He says, the monopoly of landed property is the basis of the capitalist mode of production, just as in all previous modes of production, which are based on the exploitation of the masses in one form or another. So at least here, he's linking it He's, he's, he's getting, he, he, Marx is telling his readers, if you read this volume, you'll see that land, land monopoly is the basis of capitalist mode of production. Uh, George would you know, argue and does argue very differently, but Marx is arguing that it landed property enables the, the monopoly of production, of the means of production. Uh, and that's a a source of debate that's going to come to play in the exchanges between the followers of George and those of Marx. So Marx, in this sense, recognized how land is control plays an important role and how labor and capital gain access to nature for purposes of production, that there's this certainly uh, strong link. Suffice it to say, I think that George and Marx both recognized that the wages of those who produce goods or provide services tended to fall as ground rents increased and that the ground rents remained in private hands. To Marx, the systemic implications, however, all came back to his concept of surplus value. And, and this is very different from what George's analysis tells us. Marx writes, all ground rent is surplus value, the product of surplus labor. The direct producers must work beyond the time necessary for reproducing their own labor power for their own reproduction. They must produce surplus labor in general. This is the subjective condition. So uh, Marx is totally wedded to the concept of surplus labor 
uh, and surplus value. And so he's making, in my view, he's making a moral judgment that any returns to those who actually own capital goods, capital tools, is unearned. And a question comes up immediately, well, you know, what are people who bring capital, bring capital to the production process, what do they earn? Uh, what share of total production uh, do they really deserve? And, it, and Marx is basically saying, not much or none at all. What would become a constant issue for debate between the followers of George and Marx is whether the owner of a business actually performed labor and was therefore entitled to wages equal to the value of what that labor produced and was also entitled to what amounted to additional wages equal to the value of what the capital goods employee produced. So uh, the returns to capital in that sense are, as, as George even argued, simply wages, but defined somewhat differently. Peter, I see your hand up. Join in. What can I, what question do you have or comment? Peter Frank. Well, Peter, you're, you've taken your hand down and I don't hear anything oh. from you. Uh, let's see. Okay, now. Okay, you're ready now? to go. All right, good. So in the previous slide, slide 19, um, from, the, from the quote that you got from Marx, I was wondering where did you, where does it, where did, you, you're saying that he says that people who own their own tools don't deserve the rewards for the labor they put in with those tools. But how do you get that from that quote? Well, it's, it's based on his theory of surplus value, the, that, that it's an accumulation, as I, as I interpret it, um, it's an accumulation of, of all people working together that these tools come into existence. Okay. And, and so there is this level of production that's attributed to that aggregate accumulated knowledge and accumulated use of technologies as right. opposed to what the individual does right okay that's a that's a that's, that's a, at that's least correct, that's uh, my I, interpretation tom greco has his hand up so maybe maybe he has a different view or wants to join in on that particular right. issue tom Thank you. tom i'm not hearing you so you need to unmute yourself Okay, you're unmuted. Okay, I was waiting for the host to unmute me because I couldn't do it. Oh, you couldn't do it. No. So, uh, yeah, in, in my work, uh, I've considered uh, the nature of capital a little bit. I don't know hardly anything about Marx. I have studied George to some extent. And that's why I wanted to participate in this webinar. And I thank you, Ed, for for volunteering to do it. Uh, but the way I look at capital is that uh, capital is like uh, the seed corn that a uh, farmer saves and does not consume. So That's one we, source for sure. Well, what other source is there? I mean, you, well, you, can, you can take it from nature, but that, re that requires some action, some human action, some labor. So uh, in the relationship between money and capital, I see capital as being the seed corn. So well, if you take the aggregate production of an economy, uh, the major part of it is consumed uh, currently, and uh, the other part is savings, which uh, we allocate to others, perhaps, if not ourselves, to increase our, our future productivity. So uh, in the case of an individual farmer, uh, 
uh, that seed corn goes to plant the next crop. And hopefully over time, um, the ability to grow more and more uh, will go along with that. So I think the entrepreneur certainly performs a necessary function. You know, I've been looking for entrepreneurs to help uh, implement the alternative exchange ideas uh, that I have uh, been propounding for, for many years now. And without the entrepreneurial function and the special talents that entrepreneurs have and the willingness to take risk, uh, nothing much happens. Yeah, Tom, you know, what, what you're getting into, I think, is the rationale for in modern economics to, to uh, refer to entrepreneurship as a distinct factor of production. And, well, and, Henry, if, and Henry George would not. I don't not, know if I would go that far. Uh, pardon I me? Think, uh, I think entrepreneurial activity is uh, another form of labor. It's not. A yes. OK, well, then you're in agreement with basically George's analysis that, you know, that everyone comes to the production process with a different potential pr to produce goods. Yeah. And, and based major, on your, your, your knowledge and your ability to use technologies. So right. the major yeah. problem, the major problem in today's economy is we have allowed the endless accumulation of capital into uh, pools that are controlled by fewer and fewer people. And a part of that uh, problem stems from the fact that we have these artificial entities called corporations. Well, uh, here's let me let me interrupt you because I don't. No, go ahead. This course is mostly about the history, the history, and less and less about the theoretical uh, analysis that that Georges or single taxers and and Marxists and socialists bring together. I mean, you can't avoid that discussion, but. Um, but I don't want to dwell on that. I, that's a subject for a, a whole nother series of lectures that that are that are certainly uh, warrant you know uh, some attention. But okay, uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to understand uh, history in terms of uh, what it means for us today. Well, here, here the starting point for this court this series of lectures is really that Marx uh, begins his analysis at a different point in history. He begins his analysis at a point when industrial production is becoming extremely important. And, and he, attributed, he attributes this to the accumulation of knowledge over time. And so therefore comes up with his series, his theory of surplus value, which denies to the capitalist a, um, a claim on production as a capitalist. And Henry George, is starting back at the beginning of time and the relationship that people have to nature and is building on, on that analysis as time has progressed and as the, the, the mode of production has shifted from a straightforward agrarian relationship with, with land and added on to that a first a commercial relationship where uh, you know where where Farmers are no longer growing crops so much as they're moving into the raising of cattle and sheep and industrial production. And then you add on to that the other elements that you're talking about, financial landlordism, uh, industrial landlordism. The main argument that George is making distinct from, from Marx in a sense is that the root of everything that is happening is, is still landlordism. It's still a relationship of land and the monopoly of land that drives uh, what, what is being accomplished and what is thwart, thwarting the production of wealth and how it's being distributed. Well, I uh, certainly agree with that. Okay. So um, just hang with me for a while longer and, sure, and maybe, maybe I'll, I'll help make some of these points a little clearer. Um, what... Um, What's also true about, about capital goods that's important to keep in mind, and when I'm talking about capital goods, I'm talking about equipment, machinery, technologies, is that they are depreciating assets. And depreciating assets must be maintained and eventually replaced. The monetary value of whatever wealth is produced by the use of such capital goods is the source of what is needed for ongoing maintenance and 
and replacement. So from Georgia's perspective, that's that's one solid reason why the cap the owner of capital is entitled to the yield to the to that portion of the wealth that's produced by the use of these capital goods just for the fact that you need to return in order to maintain the, that capital and to eventually replace it when it's worn out. And again, we're not talking about the money here. We're, we're talking about tangible goods produced by labor with or without the use of tools. Now, um, as the focus of these lectures isn't really to weigh in on the debate over whether Georgia Marx most accurately explained how the world actually works. I'll simply point out the fact that over the decades after the third volume of Das Kapital appeared, quite a few writers aligned with Henry George quoted from this third volume in support of the view that Marx had clum, come closer to George's conclusions. And, and so part of this story is the extent to which some followers of Marx, who, who call themselves Marxists, stopped reading after volumes one and two and had little or no understanding of what was in volume three. And that, that basically set the ground for, for the decades of debate that occurred between the followers of George and those who said they were followers of Marx. Um, as, as one example, the philosopher George Raymond Geiger, who was the son of Oscar Geiger, the founder of the Henry George School of Social Science, wrote in his book as follows, uh, The Theory of the Land Question. He says, he says, Marx, Karl Marx himself was most definitive and unambiguous in his discussion of the vital functional position occupied by land. And, um, and this is just an example of how scholars who defended Henry George's analysis looked at Das Kapital's third volume as an important correction in Karl Marx's thinking that, that evolved over the, over the history, over the time of, of Marx's writing. He goes on, and he says, uh, bear with me a second. Okay, sorry about that. In just a few pages in this book on what Marx wrote on the land question and on the nature of ground rent, um, Geiger says that Marx uh, had no illusions, or that he had no illusions that Marx had in any way really fully agreed with George, um, because George argued that the fundamental problem was not the capitalist captured returns, but that some returns to own capital were unearned, while all ground rents privately appropriated were unearned. So this is a distinction that Marx, that Marx and George had. George says, right, some returns to capitalists are unearned because they are derived from monopoly privilege, but all ground rents that are privately appropriated are unearned because all ground rents are derived from monopoly privilege. There's, and here's what he says. He says, there's no intention, there's no intention here of placing too much emphasis upon such fragmentary quotations. It is clearly realized that they are occasional rather than key remarks, and also that they may be interpreted as undoubtedly Marxians would insist, simply as recognitions of a particular form that capitalism has taken. And he ends with this. Socialists in general would argue that land, while indeed a necessary element in production and one which demands socialization, is nonetheless a subdivision of the general capitalist, capitalistic system and cannot be isolated from its relations to capital. So, it, you know, basically, Geiger is saying to other single taxers and followers of Henry George, don't make too much out of what Marx is saying. Um, and 
that was part of what was going to be debated between the socialists and, and single taxers in the next decades that followed. Um, there's a volume that was published in 1961 titled Theory and Measurement of Rent. Um, some of you might be familiar with this volume. It was, it was funded by the Lincoln Foundation, uh, which if you don't know, was established in 1947 by John C. Lincoln, uh, who was a successful industrialist and a very committed supporter of, of Henry George's analysis. And in this book, the authors survey the history of rent theory. On Marx's contribution, they offered the following. They say, Marx generalizes and broadens the Ricardian conception of differential rent, stripping away much of the original dogma. In this vein, his exposition begins not with the parable on the settlement of new country, but with a factory, not with the emergence of land rent, but of quasi rent. And so there's, there's the evolution of the analysis of Ricardo's you know, uh, law of rent and the theory of rent and the emergence among more modern economic uh, theorists of this concept of quasi rent um, and how it can be associated not just with land with land but also with with capital um, i i don't know is that dave geeson is that you uh with you have any i i see your um i hear some noise in the background okay thank you for muting um so I thought it would be helpful to give you a, a more complete definition of what is meant by quasi rent. And it, and it is essentially an above normal rate of return for the same type of activity, particularly where the supply of labor or capital is fixed even temporarily. Um, so it has a very unique set of, of restrictions on, on when rent when returns are considered quasi rent. Some economists have applied the theory of quasi rents as an argument, in fact, for taxing away all above normal income generated under these conditions. So you can think of, of it as a basis for um, leveling of income uh, when uh, people have perhaps the same are in the same circumstances, but someone is able to generate far more income than someone else that 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 excess income is considered quasi rent under under these this definition and therefore the argument is it's subject to being taxed away. Now needless to say. By the beginning of his analysis with the organization of the factory system, Marx had taken a very different route than that pursued by Henry George, uh, whose study of political economy was aroused by the settlement and populating of the frontier that was California in the 1850s. This is, the, this is what Henry George is living with. He's what, it's what he's observing, and it's what's stimulating his curiosity and his analysis. Marx is living in a in a world that's already dominated by landlord landlordism, by land monopoly, and it's also uh, he's observing that that the means of production, the capitalist means of production, is also being dominated by a small number of people uh, who gain enormous uh, economic and political power therefrom. Now, I think that we can reasonably raise the question of how closely either the supporters or opponents of George or Marx read and understood the, the analysis that both writers provided. Um, and after their deaths, and I just picked out a handful here, an almost endless stream of interpretive books were published that in significant ways either misrepresented the truths both George and Marx believed they presented or misunderstood them. And so debates over what George and Marx actually meant continued on and continue even to this day. Um, we've, we've had a number of them online recently that, that are ongoing. What it's not widely known, I think, or discussed is the extent to which the philosophies of George and Marx competed in the social 
political and intellectual arenas. And so that's that, Tom, is what the focus is of the story that I've, I'm going to try to tell in this series of lectures. The starting point is, is really the beginning of the seriousness, seriousness with which George was taken. Um, and he was read by some other political economists and obviously subjected to their criticism. Typical of the critics was this <clears throat> pamphlet by a man named Richard Simon issued in 1880 by a London publisher. And Simon begins with his assessment of George's contribution to the science of political economy. And then he spends the re remainder of the pamphlet providing what he says is the, the evidence for, for that. He writes as follows. <clears throat> he says, a book on political economy of which 30,000 copies can be sold in a few months must have some special qualities to recommend it. And although in this case, we can't, cannot praise the force and correctness of the reasoning, we must admire the literary excellence of the book and can see in Mr. George's sweeping theories, dogmatically asserted and supported with vehement eloquence, the forces which have made di disciples of so many, whose earnest anxious minds are ripe for a word of power, promising a cure specific for the evils that disturb and distress them. And he goes on to add this. Although Mr. George will never found a school of political economists, he has already become the prophet of a new faith and has made converts who are willing to become martyrs. Um, so that's an early criticism and assessment of George's work and the impact that it's having. He's building a movement. He's great. He's, he's gained tremendous attention as he says, 30,000 books are being sold a month. George's books are being translated into many other languages. Um, and yet, as someone who, who professes to be an expert in political economy, uh, at the, the modern, the cutting edge of modern thought in economic, economics and economic science, they're basically arguing that George is, is basically not right. Um, and, the, and so we have critics go on to say, to try to argue what George has missed uh, or challenge him. And, and now that is part of the basis for not only mainstream challenge to Henry George, but it will be a basis for evidence that those who adhere to the socialist view were also going to pick at Henry George's analysis. So <clears throat> this is, this level of criticism is com coming out and George is now beginning to become popular. He's lecturing extensively in the United States. He comes east to New York <clears throat> in 1880 to promote the book. And he begins to meet some of the labor leaders and, and those who are already embracing what they're calling democratic socialism. And there are many who thought at the time that Henry George is an ally to their cause. One of the few self-described socialists in the at the time in the United States who then abandoned socialism uh, by reading Henry George was, was this fellow, Charles Joseph Labadee. He's a trade unionist leader in Detroit, Michigan. And in 1881, he opens up a correspondence with Henry George. And, and from that point on, he did all he could within his role as a trade unionist leader to promote George and to promote George's solutions to, to the problems that working people had. Um, Peter Jones is a professor or was a professor of history at the University of Illinois. In 1988, he wrote an article titled Henry George and British Socialism. Uh, uh, and he says that George's perspectives appealed to both the Fabians, such as George Bernard Shaw or Sidney and Beatrice Webb, as well as the radical liberals that were led by Joseph Chamberlain. So, you know, George is having an impact on the thinking of those on the left and as well on the radical liberals. The liberals at the time in Britain are basically the champions of free trade. And 
the issue of the land question is part of what liberals are also debating and trying to work to try to solve as well. Others, others found George either too radical or too timid in his reforms that he called for. So, you know, George, as most of you certainly know, wanted to achieve peaceful transition to a just society, one in which the distribution of wealth was, was equitable based on individual contributions to that production. Um, others were not so sure that it could ever be achieved peacefully, that the resistance was going to be much too strong, and so that there would have to be some major uh, over turning of the existing regime, economic as well as political, in order to achieve the results even that Henry George was looking for. In 1880, Sidney Webb, um, who would go on in 1895 to be the co-founder of the London School of Economics, wrote to George regarding the reception he would expect when George came to Britain for the tour that was being planned. And here's what he, here's what he wrote that uh, I'll let you interpret for me because I think it's kind of, it's difficult to interpret exactly what he meant by this in his communication. He says, I am afraid that you will be denounced and attacked by the wilder kind of socialist. Neither the socialist nor any other party is the same here as in America. And the real force of the socialist movement works in lines which you do not at all disapprove. Any, any reactions to what you think Webb was really saying to George in this passage? Well, my interpretation is, is basically that at that time, most socialists uh, had really absorbed a lot of Henry George's argument and found it totally consistent with what they were trying to achieve politically. But as he says, there are wilder kinds of socialists. Um, and so when you get here, you may not get a, a reception that's going to be totally in support. You might get a lot of resistance from some of these folks. Uh, George Bernard Shaw recalled in 1904 how he was drawn into his own activism. And he says, when I was swept into the great socialist revival of 1883, I found that five, six of those who were swept in with me had been converted by Henry George, which is a strong suggestion that George's ideas were very popular and embraced by those who called themselves socialists and particularly the Fabians. I think it's important to recognize, in fact, that Henry George emerged as a public figure of a very different sort from most of his contemporaries. Uh, the values he embraced, his principles, and I, I have come to call those principles cooperative individualism. And he repeated these again and again before large and growing audiences. And this allowed Henry George, in a sense, to enter and speak his mind within the corridors of power. He had this large popular following. Um, and as, as one example of what I mean here, in 1883, he testified before a committee of the United States Senate. Uh, he was invited to, to come and testify. Those uh, you know, who were listening, who were socialists, might not fully grasp his exact message, but he was very consistent uh, with what he had to say. And in this testimony, he told the, uh, uh, elected representatives of the U.S. government, he says, I do not believe that there is any conflict of interest between labor and capital, using those terms in their large sense. I believe the conflict is really between labor and monopoly. Capital is the instrument and tool of labor, and under conditions of freedom, there would be as much competition for the employment of capital as the employment of labor. And that's a pretty succinct statement from him of exactly what he thought uh, could be done if we simply liberate labor by ending monopoly. Now, with that in mind, he's coming to Britain and he's challenging conventional wisdom on the right in particular. 
as the sales of his books continue, uh, <clears throat> one of the people who took up the challenge of responding to George was Arnold Toynbee. And he was a young political economist at Oxford University at the time. He died fairly young. Uh, I don't think he lived into his, into his th late 30s. But anyway, in January of 1883, he delivers two lectures on Henry George's book at St. Andrew's Hall in London. And in these lectures, he starts out, he's, he's very specific in distinguishing what Henry George was writing from that of Karl Marx. He says, <clears throat> the book I've undertaken to criticize does not stand alone in economic and social literature. It is one of many similar works which have been inspired by a vision, a vision of human misery. It is true that it is not filled like the work of the great socialist Karl Marx with detailed descriptions of human degradation. Nevertheless, it has human injustice for its theme. And he goes on, he says, the first pamphlet which Mr. Mr. George wrote was a pamphlet about the land question in California. And it is no wonder that he should have written the pamphlet for he saw in a country with natural resources greater than those of France and with a population at that time numbering not more than 600,000 people, tramps and paupers make their appearance. Now one would possibly conclude if you stop there that, um, that Toynbee is very sympathetic to George's analysis and looks at it as being quite accurate. But he goes on to say, he also saw the concentration of land in a few hands, one peculiar, one peculiar evil, that is to say, of an old country making its appearance in a new one. However, with that in mind, Toynbee goes on to challenge George on George's broader interpretation of history and the facts of their contemporary experience. And Toynbee was not sympathetic to the proposed solutions to societal problems that were being put forward by the socialists either. Um, in response to what George's challenge, as well as what the socialists were saying about the ills of society, Toynbee asked the question, what is to be done? I said just now that we economists abandon the belief in economic harmonies. What do we then think of the economic self-interest, which most socialists denounce as a thing to be destroyed? We say that economic self-interest most resembles a great physical force than anything else. The laws which must be studied in order that it may be controlled. Um, I don't know what that indicates to you, but it indicates to me that Toynbee was in the cusp, the vanguard of those who believed in planning, that the role of government is to recognize the negative aspects of the system that's in place and use the tools of economics to help come up with policies that would plan better outcomes. Does it mean you challenge the system at its roots? No. It's, in a sense, I think an acknowledgement is we're making progress, and this may be the best we can do. And we can, we can tinker with the system at its edges, but it's a very dangerous thing to try to do what Henry George is, try, is trying to do, or the socialists are trying to do, in the sense of, of of changing the system at its fundamental core or overturning it altogether, because what then will happen? We know what, what we're getting now. We think we know how to manage it for better outcomes, but um, he sounds to me like he's anticipating Keynes. Anyone else have a different thought on that based on what I little I've read to you? Michael. You're on the right track, uh, you're, Ed. I'm uh, on the right track. I think I definitely think you're on the right track. I'm a real fan. Uh, because basically what Henry George was doing was seeking, seeking, he was trying to understand the, 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 the fact that there was poverty and, and riches, etc. He was trying to 
really come to grips with what were the essential things that were happening. And I think that's a noble, um, you know, a noble study and, and one we, we must continue and, and not be indoctrinated by a particular dogma, perhaps, that we, we're quite well attached to. Here in England, it's there's socialists and socialists and socialists, all, and they all have a different em emphasis, et cetera, as, they were, as conservatives have a different f form of conservatism, conservatism, conserv and the same in America, Republican, Democrat, all, all got different aspects which they perhaps concentrate on and, and are, are attached to, and it colors the, the openness that's required to really find the real causes of, of you know, of, of, of economics. I mean, it, it starts at the beginning of, of Henry George, doesn't it? Why is it that there is poverty in such areas? That's the point. As I want you, know, to make. you know, George was trying to resurrect uh, political economy as a scientific discipline and exactly. correct the errors that he found in his predecessors and contemporaries. Exactly. Um, you know, the socialists will eventually argue that that they are attempting to do the same thing through scientific socialism and and that that they're less ideologically driven than they are accused of being. Peter, I see your hand up. Yes. Uh, um, look, uh, this time we bit, I found, suddenly find very interesting because. Uh, Peter, I'm having some difficulty in understanding you. Uh, maybe uh, you could, can you turn uh, your uh, microphone up a little? Uh, how's that sound? Okay, go I, ahead. I'll okay, turn my uh, speaker up. I'll try and not mumble. I'm so very sorry. Um, I find Toynbee's uh, toy comment extremely interesting uh, because what he's saying is we need to understand economic theory to, so we can control it. And, you know, um, that gets really to the heart uh, what I keep on referring you know, back to and that is, is, is the success of East Asia. And that is based on a system whereby money is, 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 money is controlled by, by uh, directives from the central bank or from the government. So, um, you know, if we don't understand what's going on out there, I mean, I think it's a very, very good point of point, but if we don't understand the economics of what's going out, out there, then we need to understand it, and then we need to find a way in which the community controls it. So I don't think just necessarily land, uh, understanding land as Henry George did, is actually going to solve a problem for us. I think we actually need to understand the bigger picture and then have mechanisms so it's, it's controlled. Uh, and I think that's a very good point that Troy made. Yes, I, 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 I'm very heartened by that. I think, you know, one, one, uh, one obs observation I'd make is that that as, as economics evolved, externalities became a major part of the analysis, uh, analysis of economists. Uh, and they basically tried to identify the many shocks to the system. And so this to me is what, what Toynbee is pointing to and later Keynes. What are the things that, that cause shocks to the system? And how can we minimize those shocks while we preserve the essential core system itself? I, I, I don't know, do you agree? Is that a, a fair analysis of what you think that Toynbee and, and the Keynesians were, were making a case for? Would you, would you agree? Okay. So in 1883, um, a very inexpensive edition of Progress and Poverty was printed, and it sold very quickly some 40,000 copies in Britain. And, and this, was bef this is before George arrives. He comes to London in 1884, and you know, his books are being read, or at least they're being purchased. How thoroughly they're being read and studied is another question. But, but they're being sold, they're being read to some degree, and he completes an extensive lecture tour that was organized by the Land Reform Union at the, at the time. And Henry George, in his biography of his father, um, was reports that George was quite aware of the socialist influence within the Land Reform Union. 
And here's, here's what Henry George Jr. has to say about the, the implications of that. It, it, um, let me correct myself. Okay, here he goes. He writes, before he opened the course, Mr. George had to settle two important questions. The first affected his attitude towards socialism. Mr. Champion, the treasurer, and Mr. Frost, the secretary of the Land Reform Union, were in reality not wholly in harmony with the individualism of progress and poverty, but believed rather in the collectivism of Karl Marx, who had a few months before died in London after a long residence there. And what did that mean? Okay, so he goes on, Henry George Jr. goes on to say, these two men with one or two others waited on Mr. George and plainly said that if he did not make the socialistic program part of his own and call for nationalization of capital, including all machinery, the socialists would be compelled to oppose his campaign. Uh, well, what do you think Henry George said to that? I'll tell you right now. <laughs> His son says, Mr. George replied with some sharpness that he had come across the sea on invitation, on invitation of the Land Reform Union to lecture on the principles with which his name was identified and no others, that his principles were clearly explained in his books, and that the socialists would support or oppose as they pleased. So George was not going to change his positions in order to gain more popular support or to gain allies within the socialist camp. And George was consistent with that. Um, he, he expressed his view that the real enemy of working people was monopoly in all its forms. Uh, the monopoly of nature of land uh, being what even Winston Churchill would some years later describe as quote, the mother of all monopolies. George's presence and his lectures across Britain and Ireland significantly increased the sales of progress and poverty, as well as the sales of this just published book at the time, Social Problems. So George recognizes that progress and poverty is a little deep. It's not accessible to everyone. So uh, Social Problems is a publication of a series of of magazine articles that he wrote, plus several others that he added. And he tried to write these to be very accessible to the average person who did not need any education in political economy to understand the message that he was delivering. And so e even today, I, when people ask me, what should I read uh, the written by Henry George, I say the first thing to read is the book Social Problems. From there, you can go on you know, to, to some of his more advanced work. To many people living in countries where uh, for centuries the land had been under the control of an aristocracy, an entrenched aristocracy, the only chance for an improved life was to do what? And that was to migrate to a part of the world where the opportunity to acquire land existed. There's uh, in, you know, many people uh, left out of the system didn't necessarily want to remove the system but simply get a foothold in it. And so my, my forefathers and many of you on this, on this, on this call, um, your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents decided to pick up and leave. Uh, and they headed for parts unknown on ships that were uncomfortable. And many people didn't make the trip. They died of disease on the, on the journey, but uh, found their way to North America or Australia or New Zealand or South Africa or other un, un, uh, untamed frontier lands. That has been a major part of the reason for human migration, the desire to acquire free or cheap land. Not the only one, of course, uh, all sorts of, of, of reasons why people left their homeland because of political or religious oppression, et cetera. But with the opportunity to gain free or, or inexpensive access to land disappearing by Henry George's time, there, there needed to be some 
way to address this situation. And that's what George was trying to offer, I think. The operation of markets was increasingly dominated as well by monopolistic enterprises who, that were protected under laws enforced by supportive police powers of the state. Um, you know, and this is, this is what Marx looked at as the main reason why surplus value was being captured by those who didn't produce anything. The followers of George and Marx attempted to build popular movements to rid, rid civilization of these inequities, but they wanted to do it by very different means. And as their followers continue to argue, expected rather different outcomes. George and his followers expected the outcome to be the liberation of labor and the free exchange of goods and services and the almost unlimited production of wealth. Whereas Marx's followers believed there had to be much greater control over individual activity uh, in order to achieve the outcomes that they were looking for. So there's this ideological conflict. And in this environment, workers were everywhere organizing. So the trades union movement is spreading around the world as, of course, one way to get a fairer share of what was being produced for those who are working every day in the factories, in the mines, uh, in the shops. And one leader who rose within the ranks of the railroad workers in the United States was Eugene Debs. Um, and initially, Debs is courted for public office by leaders of the Democratic Party in the United States. He's not looked at as a, as a danger to the system, but because he has a growing constituency among uh, labor union members, Debs is recognized as someone who has potential political power. With each passing year, Debs became convinced the problems went very deeper than trade unionism could solve. Um, in, in this biography of Debs by Nick Salvatore, Salvatore goes into the evolution in Debs's thinking. And here's what he had to say about Debs. Reflecting the traditional American emphasis on the promise of nature, Debs presented his case for the eight hour day. Poverty existed not due to some Malthusian theory or Darwinian selection, but because work itself was not fairly distributed. Further, wages were often below subsistence levels. Similarly, Debs condemned the growing scarcity of free land. Relying on John Stuart Mill, not Henry George, Debs argued that land derived its productive power from nature and ought not to be controlled by a few. So Debs is aware of the land question and the land problem. To what extent he, is he aware of Henry George? Well, in 1885, he reviews progress in poverty for his fellow trades unionists. And here's what he writes, quote, every laborer in the land should read and study it well. There is much thought in it and much melancholy truth. So he's absorbed Henry George. And at that point in time, he's uh, looking to George as, as inspiration for what the labor movement should be thinking. At a meeting of the American labor leaders in July of 1894, this is you know, almost a decade later, he adds us the following, he says, We must go to the foundation causes if we wish to cure the evil from which we suffer through industrial depression and starvation and wretchedness. And I want to advise every member of the railway union and every working man to invest in a book called Progress and Poverty, the greatest book of the century, written by Henry George, the acknowledged prophet of the labor movement the world over. Take it home, read it, study it and you will there find the solution of the difficulty in the single tax. This will solve the problem. And I wish that wherever men can be found who are thoroughly grounded in this principle and otherwise qualified, the laboring men would nominate and elect them to Congress. Um, there's a labor leader who at that point in time just expresses that Henry George is 
the profit of the working for the working man's solution to the working man's life. Not, however, uh, things are changing rapidly, and by the end of nineteen of eighteen ninety six, Debs has changed his mind significantly. He becomes convinced that the virtues there are virtues in what he calls enlightened socialism. So although he continues to quote Henry George with some frequency, he no longer is writing with the belief that even if the full rent of land was public, publicly collected, this would level the playing field for the world's workers. He now believes that and argues that there must be a stronger role for the state and that it is through socialism that there is going to be an improved condition for the working men. I've searched, in fact, all of his published writings. And what really astounded me that I could find no comment by Debs on the death of Henry George the next year. For someone who had made the statements that I read earlier, um, why, he, why he totally moved away from George and did not even acknowledge George's passing is, is hard for me to understand and reconcile. But in fact, that seems to be the case. In the July 30th, 1887 issue of Henry George's newspaper, The Standard, George identifies Lawrence Grunlin as providing the, quote, best exposition on socialism by an American. George added that what German socialism offered was the following. He says, German socialism offers a high purposed but incoherent mixture of truth and fallacy, the defects of which may be summed up in its want of radicalism, that is to say, of going to the root. So George sees socialism as mitigation at best, and without dealing with land monopoly, you have not been radical enough. Um, even if, if I, Henry George, want to get there by peaceful incremental means, uh, my, my offering is to really rebuild society on, just, on a just foundation. And that is not the case, he believes, with what the socialists are arguing. Grunlin responds with a long pamphlet he titles Socialism versus Tax Reform, an answer to Henry George. Uh, Grunlin first reprints in full what George wrote in the Standard, the article that I quoted from. Then he calls George to task for what Grunlin saw as a superficial criticism of socialist thought. He says in the pamphlet, first of all, it is evident from George's objections that he does not understand socialism. But that, but what shall we say of the choice lot of, of adjectives which he applies to a system or a philosophy which has been elaborated during at least 40 years by some of the most learned and gifted by common consent of Europeans? Um, think about that quote for a few seconds. George is challenging what Grunlin believes are the best minds of European thought. And that, that the thinking of these individuals hasn't been static, it's been evolving based on their debate, their continued analysis. And, and here comes Henry George taking on these, these bright, very bright individuals and basically saying to them, well, gentlemen, you've missed the core. Um, one of the best studies of the evolution of socialist thought that I have found is this book uh, by Edward Hyams, The Millennium Postponed Socialism from Sir Thomas More to Mao. Uh, it came out in 1974. I don't know, has anyone else read this book perhaps? Um, it, I don't know if there's a, uh, a, a an electronic version of it available online, but it's definitely worth, worth picking up and reading if you can get a cheap copy on eBay or Amazon. Uh, but Hyams explains to readers that there were two roads leading to the so, what he's calling the socialist millennium. He writes, there's the, the Marx-Engels road, 
by way of the Hegelian state, and the road sketched by such men as Godwin and Tom Paine, and firmly inked in and corrected by Pierre Joseph Proudhon, which entailed the demolition of a state and elimination of formal government. Well, I, I don't know that, that, that Godwin and Paine went that far. Proudhon, in my view, basically argued in his writing for creating a parallel state based on mutualism. I mean, his, his writings often talk about uh, working people just forming cooperatives, starting mutualist banks, and, and living a separate existence from the established state, state and the existing economy. Uh, whether that was ever possible or not, I, you know, I don't think we, we've, we found out, although one modern Marxist economist that I'll talk about later in this course, his name is, is Richard Wolff, is very much impressed with the progress of the Mondragon community in Spain and the uh, cooperative enterprise that has existed in the Mondragon area of Spain for, for many, many decades and operates under, under democratic capitalist principles. So it, it seems to me that there's that room for the evolution in socialist thinking uh, that's exhibited by, by cooperative enterprise. And certainly Proudhon was a leading proponent of, of that at the time in the, in the early part of the 19th century. And Heim says this about uh, what Marx thought. He says, for Marx, the state could and should by socialization be made the source of all good comprised as it would be of the whole people, the Hegelian synthesis of man and nation and ultimately of man and mankind. For Proudhon and the anarchists in general, the state could not but be the embodiment of injustice so that the very first step to the millennium must be to get rid of that incubus. Um, can you do that peacefully and incrementally um, or does it require a revolution? So, you know, anarchists, and, and this, is, this is something we could get into, but, but just to think about what is the definition of an anarchist? Uh, we think of an anarchism as some sort of violent group but basically, aren't anarchists believers in voluntary cooperation? That all entities must be formed on the basis of voluntary cooperation. And so the question is, uh, will human beings ever evolve to that level of cooperation that you don't need the state? Uh, I don't know, Bill, as a political scientist, maybe you have an opinion on that particular uh, point. I guess I'm unmuted. I think we're going in the opposite direction. And there's ever more forces working against the harmonization of people, uh, not just current so-called developed countries, but in third world countries as well. Population explosion alone challenges the possibility of collaboration. But elaborate on that for a second. I mean, George argued that there's no direct relationship between population and poverty. Uh, but, but certainly, you know, the uh, rapid increase in, in human population right now has placed a heavy put, pr footprint on the planet and on the resources of the planet. My, my sense is that we we need to lower the increase in, in population growth to zero and decline our population just to give the planet a time to recover. Uh, I don't know if that's what you meant, but. Well, um, I was thinking of the, of the whole idea of ecological footprint, but there's another dimension to this. And that's that um, there are, uh, there are threats to our existence that emerge unanticipated. Um, oh, some of the most dire are the current uh, uh, plagues and uh, pandemics. 
and I don't think we're ever going to completely eliminate uh, the uh, the prospect of uh, pandemics. Well, in a, in a sense, the world has become very integrated too quickly, and and we were we evolved with very specific resistances to disease in our own environment. And now we have shared the diseases, the sources of disease from other parts of the world where uh, you know people have never inhabited. I mean, certainly that was the, the case when Europeans arrived in the Americas and the Europeans suffered from certain diseases that the population, the tribal peoples of, of the Americas had dealt with through through the evolution of uh, and over time but you know massive uh, which is estimated 90 percent of the people who existed in the americas at the time the first human europeans arrived by a century later the, the population had diminished by 90 percent because of of the introduction of diseases that they had no resistance to and well there's there's another dimension here that uh, recently there's there's been a few articles one i recall uh, in the last couple of months in the economist that uh, noted that the actual leveling off of the population in many countries uh, removes the specter of population explosion but it's not that the number of people it's the it's the footprint. It's yeah. the consumption of resources, uh, and um, we we have uh, not just uh, the use of the conventional uh, food uh, food consumption and um, energy, but we're we're finding other uh, uh, threats to nature. Uh, there, there's two conferences going on in the next week in Glasgow. Everyone knows about the uh, the the uh, uh, climate change, but there's another one going on concurrently about the wiping out of species, which is is just as threatening. Yeah, the the reason I wanted you to comment in a sense was. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Yeah. So there were these concerns, certainly, you know, at the turn of the uh, the beginning of the 20th century that we're getting into. You know, all, all these concerns about population growth and what it was going to do, the demands on the land, the, the uh, extinction of species. Uh, and people were trying to come up with solutions, but but the world is moving so fast. People are migrating, you know, all all across the across the world, leaving their homelands, uh, trying to start anew. And now Henry George is basically, you know, saying, "Well, we've run out of frontiers. We now have to figure out how to live with one another because we can. We no longer have the easy option of separating from those we disagree with or can't get along with or who are oppressing us." And the socialists are saying, you're absolutely right, but it's going to require that we overturn the existing political structure and so that we can introduce these changes. Well, uh, and I'll finish up with tonight's first lecture talking about uh, one of the, the, the personalities that, that Bill has been very interested in and interested me in, who was very much engaged in this, in this debate. And that is Jose Marti, the leader, the, the early leader of the Cuban nationalist movement. And, uh, and Marti was working in New York uh, to try to organize the uh, Cubans who were there to get back to Cuba and liberate cu Cuba from Spanish domination. Um, and Marti had studied Marx but he rejected the path offered to the oppressed by Marx. He uh, actually attended a memorial meeting in honor of Marx and about, about Marx, here's what he said. 
looking at this large hall, Karl Marx is dead. He deserves to be honored for declaring himself on the side of the weak. But the virtuous man is not the one who points out the damage and burns with generous anxiety to put it right. He is the one who teaches a gentle amendment of the injury. And how did he come to this conclusion? Well, he had met and become friends with Henry George. Um, he absorbed what George conveyed to him, took these ideas to his fellow Cuban nationalists, and basically here is someone who's a revolutionary leader and he's, and he's committed to the use of force to overturn an imperialist regime that dominates the Cubans. But when that's over, when that's successful, he plans to implement a society built on the principles that Henry George offered. And what's really important about Jose Marti that I finally came to is what George offered was a path to change consistent with Marti's religious convictions. And this, and this is what he had to say. Henry George's progress in poverty has spread among Christians as a Bible. It is the Nazarene's love put in the practical language of our times. And so, you know, is Henry George a prophet? Uh, with religious conviction. Marx is telling people that religion is the opiate of the masses and is arguing a different, different way to think about how change would occur. But you have this dichotomy that's, a, that's going on now. And Marti is just one example where we can come all the way today and say, what is the role of religious doctrine in the liberation of the human spirit or in its degrade, degradation. And, and I think that that's part of the debate. But again, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And this is, and Marti is just one example of in fact, how this is evolving. So with that, I will stop tonight. And we'll pick up the story from that point next week. Um, um, stick around as long as any one of you wishes to have some discussion about tonight's lecture. Um, and as long as Ibrahima uh, will allow us to continue that discussion. Uh, so with, with that, you've heard what I've, what I've introduced. How does this strike you? I hope, I hope this is a, a story that is, is attracting your, your interest and, and that maybe I've piqued your interest to do a little bit more research on your own. But by the way, I recorded the entire course uh, and it's up online on my YouTube channel. Um, without discussion, uh, you can listen to all four lectures in two hours. Um, but it's, it takes us a lot longer in, in, in the Zoom environment with, with, with discussion to cover the same material. But in case, in case you, you're not able to attend the next class, and as Ibrahima indicated, we're going to be away next week because of a special program that the Council of Georgia's Organizations is putting on at the same time. So with that, any thoughts, questions, comments? Michael. And Bick, Bill wants to add as well. Michael. Go ahead, Michael. Unmute yourself. Uh, there we go. Yeah, thank you, Ed. But I like the way you presented it because you know you're presenting George as uh, as a sort of intellectual revolution. In other words, you know, he's putting forth the case of how to organize a social political, a social economic system when there's no already set up system for it, which started out in America. And, and it came around the time when a lot of the frontier was finishing. So it, 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 was, a, it was really uh, impingent that something be organized. And he was doing it on an individualistic basis, you know, which was not happening in Europe. In Europe, they were trying to form large labor unions and labor movements.
Yeah, so, I mean, that's going on. That's going on in the United States. It's going in, on in all the countries where the system of law is inherited from Europe, whether it's inherited from Britain or from France or from Germany or whatever. You know, the, those societies are evolving based on on fundamental European concepts of law and and uh, and contract and 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 economic system. So the frontier experience was really looked at by historians such as Frederick Jackson Turner uh, as molding the American character to some degree. And there's been constant debate since of whether Turner's thesis is in fact accurate. But, but certainly the life on the frontier has been credited as a source of individualism of the sense that Americans have evolved in a self-reliant way. And I think that's um, probably the feeling of people in, in, in other such uh, lands that were, that were previously uh, uh, not very densely populated where Europeans came. And so we're talking about you know, all of the Americas, but most prominently those that, that uh, evolved with English uh, with England's law as the basis for law, I think. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ed. Bill, I think you're 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 next on the list. Uh, okay, three quick thoughts. Uh, with reference to Marti, um, all of his writing, and a good part of it is poetry, has been compiled and is downloadable. Uh, from a website, and you can get it on a CD or, or any way electronically. But what is most interesting, I think, about Marti is that if you go count the number of books on Amazon, just in English, there are about 50 <clears throat> books in English published in the last 10 years or so. I counted them on Amazon. Uh, clearly, there's somebody really interested in, in Marti. I haven't really explored it much further, but obviously, well, maybe it's because of the volatility of Cuban politics. I don't know. Well, Second, I, I was just going to add uh, uh, that some of you may have attended the lecture that I did that delivered on Jose Marti's life. And the recorded version of that is up online on my YouTube channel uh, as well. But, um, but as Bill said, Marti, Marti is, a, is, his insights are gathering a lot more attention. I, I think that has something to do with, with the evolution of of the socialist model in Cuba. And just as in China, perhaps the writings of Sun Yat-sen might begin to receive greater intellectual attention. The writings of Marti uh, uh, might, might actually be experienced the same sort of renewed attention. I, I don't know if you'd right. agree with that, uh, Bill. A second, a second observation I want to make was from your book, that you cited that was published by the Lincoln Institute Theory and Measurement of Rent. And there are four authors, all professing to be Georgists. And the first half of the book, at least by Mason Gaffney's reading, until page 104, was really an excellent discussion of the history and evolution of the concept of rent. But the last half of the book, um, Mason said is not worth a thing. Okay, they totally went off the, the off the track. But um, I mention it just because it is a very good discussion on the first half of the concept of rent as it evolved uh, historically and intellectually. I have not tried to find what find out whether the book is available. Yeah, online anywhere, uh, but maybe it's worth searching. And if it is available, I might try to resurrect it and put it up on, on my website and library. Well, it, it's published in 1961, 
by Chilton. Yeah. Uh, I think Chilton's the company that uh, publishes books about uh, motor vehicle care, and, and, uh, isn't it? I'm not sure if it's the same Chilton. Yeah, I, I have a hard copy of the book, Bill, but I'm not, yeah. I, it wasn't on my list of books to scan. But yeah, understandable. <laughs> but I thought I'd mention that. Okay. Yeah. Anything else before I, I uh, let Wayne have the, the floor? Not right not now. Right now. Go okay, ahead. Go okay. ahead. <laughs> Okay, this is Wayne Looney. I, I noticed uh, James Shirk in, in the chat asked what the uh, Fabians were, and nobody seems, seems to answer. So I'll start at one. There are probably people in the in who know who can answer better than I can. But they were a group of uh, English intellectuals started in the late nineteenth, early twentieth century, who were basically were promoting uh, uh, ideas that would would later be uh, used to uh, to bring about the so-called welfare welfare state. Included in this were, I think, were uh, Sidney Webb, who you, whose photo you saw earlier tonight, and his, and his uh, wife, Beatrix Webb, and I think George Bernard Shaw may be involved. And it's basically kind of a, uh, kind of a early, early think camp for, for uh, uh, advocating a welfare, welfare state or semi-socialist ideas. If anyone else has something to add, that would be great. Thank you. Well, one thing I will add is that um, Joseph Fells, when he went to England, and I and Fells is another uh, person that I have prepared a, a biographical lecture on that you can take a look at. Um, but Fells, you know, went to England to try to do what he could to get to to make the English movement on behalf of land value taxation or the single tax uh, spread. And at the time, he tried to cultivate the uh, Fabian socialists, including the Webbs. And uh, uh, he was not particularly successful with them. And, and, and the socialists in, in Britain uh, had, an, had something to say to him uh, negatively that they thought Fells was simply a defender of his class because Fells made his fortune as a as an industrialist manufacturing soap products. And he first went to England partly to expand his business enterprise there, as well as to, to, uh, to try to promote the single tax in Henry George's campaign. But, but the socialists, the webs at least, and some of the socialists thought that he was more concerned about protecting the interests of his class than helping the downtrodden. Uh, Tom, you're next. You need to unmute yourself, Tom. If you're, you almost got there. Am I there? Now you're, now you're okay. there. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, excellent, uh, Ed, as always. And um, so my question is uh, sort of the entire premise of, of, of this notion that that Marxists and and uh, Georgists had a similar cause. And the, the idea <laughs> because, you know, so actually one one bit of clarification. So you know, there's obviously, you know, different types of socialism and there's the dictatorial socialism that, that Marx advocated. Um, and then there's the, the, the European type of socialism, which is just basically an expanded welfare state, which occurred, you know, famously in 1909 with the British and then, you know, the beverage report, 1942, et cetera. So they, expanded social services is a very different thing than having the state own everything. So it's always, it's always uh, uh, been an, an interest of mine um, to try and, and make sure that people understand the difference between those two things and, and how differently they're applied. And um, so the question then becomes, so George, George was a believer in free trade. He was a believer in, in capitalism. So there, there really isn't a fundamental shared cause between Henry George and Karl Marx. Both obviously had the, the concern of the average person, the, the laborer in, in mind, 
but they had very different worldviews and other than both of them trying to to benefit the working man um there's really very little intersection in their thought well i would disagree with that to this extent that that um the followers of of george and the followers of marx and those who embraced uh, various versions of the single tax doctrine and some, some more modern followers of Henry George have declared themselves to be neo-Georgists and the socialists had, had uh, similar uh, nuanced views of what socialism meant. And so when you say the state cake takes control of all production, well, that's an extreme view. Even, even in, in the Soviet Union, there was a certain amount of enterprise permitted. So we're talking about, in a sense, um, what is the level of, of state control and state planning over individual production and individual activities? And so some would argue only it's only necessary for the state to control monopolistic enterprises, enterprises that are inherently monopolistic, so natural resources and land, but that you know, people can own shops, be, do retail, uh, or they can have plots of land to grow you know, a small amount of, of agricultural products and even have a market, market there. So they have all sorts of different views on the extent to which these, these fundamental ideas should be implemented. And, uh, and that's what the rest of the story is going to show how much debate there was over these th things, Tom. Uh, Cuba. I don't know who that is, but please identify yourself. Hi, Ed. Um, I'm an economic research assistant for the school. So I have, uh, I have listened to uh, some of your talks before. And so I just wanted to comment that um, your presentation was uh, fantastic. And I see it as refreshing in the sense that um, it provides a very good uh, comparison between Georgism and Marxism. And for me, since I would consider myself young, I'm 24 right now. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of my you're very friends... young, by the by the. <laughs> if you look at most of us are on this in this meeting, you're very young. Okay, I would agree. Um, but I want to say that I noticed that a lot of my friends or not, let's say not even close friends, but colleagues or people that I just know, um, a lot of them are big, well, big fans, I guess you could say, of Marxism, of socialism. I know social, socialism and Marxism aren't uh, quite the same, but um, you can see where I'm getting here, uh, what I'm getting at in the sense that um, they focus on, say, Marxism or socialism and see it as the only other alternative to just, you know, pure capitalism. And I think your presentation tonight has uh, has provided, you know, another another approach, um, just another another approach is, you know, how can we interpret Georgism and what are, you know, how is it similar to socialism and Marxism and yet how is it different? And let's say, in what ways is it better? Uh, so I think it's uh, if I were to share this with my friends, uh, you know, or just other younger people, and they saw this approach, you know, it might it might change their minds. Uh, and I always like to say that a lot of times I'll see in mainstream media, it all depends also on the source. Uh, but a lot of times I'll see in mainstream media, I'll see headlines that rail against capitalism, um, you know, and suggest Marxism or socialism as another approach. Um, and to have Georgism as a different alternative is also just refreshing as well. So well, I just yeah, it feel I, a lot better now. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I certainly encourage you to uh, invite any of your friends to join in on these on these lectures. And if, if people don't have the time to spend, you know, uh, online in the evening, again, I've I've pre-recorded all the lectures. Um, uh, the, the four lectures altogether take two hours to listen to um, in, in, in the classroom or on in our Zoom discussions. Obviously, they take a lot more uh, time to get through, but uh, hopefully it will give those people a, a reason to think a little bit differently about where we're heading and what sort of solutions are, are appropriate to some of the major problems that we've been talking about. 
you know, including the environmental issues that we face. Um, how can we tame urban sprawl? How can we make reduce our footprint on the planet? Well, Henry George's ideas are, I think, yeah, essential to to those outcomes, and and hopefully they'll find that that perspective persuasive. And I agree with that because then if somebody takes a quick look at any major news website right now, and they're really there aren't uh, any other really alternatives offered besides it's just either capitalism, socialism, there's nothing really in between. But then if you look at George, you have, I would say, a perfect answer. But I have hope for the future. It may not happen maybe in my lifetime, but maybe in the future. <laughs> well, let's hope it happens in your lifetime because you're still pretty darn young. Uh, many of us are, are here. We're not expecting a lot to happen in our <laughs> lifetimes, but at least, you know, we're creating... Um, the Henry George School and its work, um, the Robert Schockenbach Foundation and its work is, is establishing a legacy, an intellectual legacy. And, you know, uh, hopefully over time, it will begin to, again, attract more and more thoughtful people who are not ideologically driven, but are looking for pragmatic analysis and understanding of, of what can be done to solve our problems. Joe, I think you're, you're uh, next on our, our list. Thank you. Um, great presentation. I'm looking forward to the other ones. Uh, this looks like a great series. Um, before I, I um, make my comment or ask a question, I just I put in the chat that um, the Alliance for Just Money is uh, has a presentation coming up on October the 25th. I hope that doesn't click with something in the Henry George programs. Um, but um, that main title or theme is building bridges. And that is, uh, as you probably know, um, Alliance for Just Money is, is kind of on the positive money side of things or the American Monetary Institute side of things, the Chicago plan side of things. And um, looking at building bridges with like-minded groups uh, like Henry George. <clears throat> um, and since Henry George was a greenbacker and some of you are probably interested in monetary reform, I just want to let you know that that's coming up and they want to brainstorm about enlarging, uh, you know, creating critical mass amongst like-minded groups so that we can focus on getting things done um, as well as education we're getting tonight. Um, the socialist that my comment was maybe question uh, the issue of socialization. Tom mentioned uh, you know the different variations and so forth. Uh, you know, we, when I was taking economics in the seventies, um, they talked about a mixed economy, and basically it was the free you know capitalism and socialism being mixed together. That's we have a lot of socialized goods and services, um, <clears throat> and and the very committed free marketers, including Friedman's uh, mentors said, you know, if a public utility that everybody uses probably should be socialized. Um, uh, a, a natural monopoly perhaps should be socialized. And the way I see uh, Henry George is that he wishes to socialize um, the benefits uh, that the community adds uh, to private, privately owned land. He wants to socialize the, the appreciation that the land benefits from all of that community investment. And I think that's a great way of looking at it. Uh, and, and therefore there is a connection between uh, socialism in one sense. And- uh, In this, and in this debate, Joe, you know, I, I, here's the way I try to put it into a certain context is this, the debate between those who want a better world recognizing that, they, that the status quo is unacceptable is over the right balance between property rights and human rights. And so the disagreement is very much between those, those two, two uh, you know, related objectives. What is the right balance between property rights and human rights? Well, first of all, you have to identify what property is, and what are legitimate claims to property and how that relates to what our legitimate human rights are and what are our legitimate human rights. So 
the debate, you know, continued and it never, it hasn't really yet been fully resolved. Um, you know, this, the search, there's, there's this ongoing, in my view, ongoing uh, ideological, but almost cultural debate over whether or not there is a, such a thing as universal human rights or whether or not each society, each social group has uh, responsibility and authority to establish law based on its own culture. Uh, you know, one can call it moral relativism or cultural relativism, uh, but there is, I think historically, there is this battle over what are universal rights that we all can claim as human beings, regardless of the society in which we happen to live. And we're still, we're still struggling with that pretty significantly. But George was, was trying to work that out, as were, as were the socialists. And so they're debating on what the path, what's the right path to get us to that balance. Well, we certainly have uh, moved a long way from his time. I mean, you could look upon income taxes as confis confiscation. You can look at capital gains taxes and inheritance taxes the same way. And it's recognizing the fact that um, your property rights aren't absolute, that the community is involved as well, society is involved as well. There are social goods and services that have to be. Provided. Without going into an extensive discussion, when you mention capital gains, I would, I would argue for consideration that there are no such things as earned capital gains. Uh, actual capital, tangible goods, equipment, machinery are all depreciating assets. They never sell for more than their cost of acquisition or production because the value depreciates over time. Um, there is an exception, of course, and that is when the capital good eventually becomes a collectible. So you could have you know, a building that's old and deteriorated, but would sell for much more than, than its actual uh, book, uh, bricks and mortar value because some architect who's renowned was the designer of the building. And so it needs to be preserved and has a value uh, very different from its, its value as a capital good. Bill. Yeah, I wanted to add one more thing, just because we frequently get caught up in our own narrow uh, discourse. Uh, you notice how much the central race theory and the idea of reparations has taken hold among minority communities. Hmm. But what is less evident, uh, mainly because they just don't have the uh, the visibility and media power is that the Native American uh, tribes have done lots of work on what is called the discovery doctrine. And uh, there's quite a few books about it. And I suggest the easiest thing to do would be to go on the, uh, the web, Wikipedia or the website. But it's the basic idea, the discovery doctrine, that, hey, uh, finders keepers. And if you found it first, it's yours. And it was the 11th century popes that first awarded titles to lots of the North American and South American continents to the explorers. And then these ideas disseminated more widely thereafter. But I think uh, we can make Chris, a lot of Christian alliance. Christian explorers only, though, Bill. Christian yeah. explorers only. <laughs> yeah. But um, I think we can make common alliance with the Discovery Doctrine people, and we haven't yet. Common alliance or to convince them that their, 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 their analysis, their, their basis for believing in it is wrong. Well, I think it's a little more complex than that. Well, you and I will have to have a discussion at some some point on that. Peter. Okay. Just a quick question, a quick point in regarding collecting capital gains. Surely if we collected the rent correctly, there wouldn't be any capital gain uh, for the rent to be collected 
annually that we know the cumulative gain in capital value of land. But the other point I just wanted to make was, and I don't know whether I'm right there or not, but the other point I want to make is that even if we did collect all the um, economic rent, going back to your point, Ed, about um, the, the, the tension between human rights and uh, land rights and the, or, uh, uh, the tension between those two things, even if we collected all the economic rent on the land, would that overcome the problems of inequality and the poor people and also extremely rich people who get rich from other sources other than land? Would that, would that really solve the equality problem? Well, I, I think we're, we're talking about a domino effect, uh, a, a positive domino effect. And that's what George anticipated would occur. And again, you know, there's, it's a combination of eliminating the confiscation of wealth produced by individuals at the same time, collecting uh, the value that's, that's created by society, you know, in land values. So yeah, I guess my answer, my feeling would be the pace of, of improvement would be determined on how much rent is collected out of the total fund available and how much taxes are still being collected on production and earned income. So that's why, that's why the single tax you know, idea was, was one that was advocated as something to implement as quickly as possible. You know, collect more rent, collect less, earn, let, collect less revenue from taxing the things that we want to be produced and that we think are earned. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think it was, I, I may be wrong on this, attributed to either Mason Gaffney or Harry Pollard, uh, and maybe Harry stole it from Mason, who said, better to collect the rent and throw it in the ocean than not collect it. <laughs> so there would be a a very positive result just by taking rent out of person, out of private hands, even if we didn't use it for the benefit of, of the society. It'd be a good experiment to try, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting line for the closing, Ed. Thanks a lot, that was a fantastic uh, class as usual. Uh, just to repeat, we will not meet next week because of the event at the CGO. We are having Jamie Galbraith, if you can make it. Uh, I'm going to be there, so I hope everyone can make it too. Uh, we are meeting next week, but it's going to be on Monday with Dan Sullivan class citing a new course on uh, uh, the science of political economy before and after Henry George. So for Ed's class, we, the next meeting is going to be on the 28th. Thank you very much and see you on Monday. Thanks, everyone. Enjoyed it. I hope you did too. <laughs> <laughs>